Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Northern Kentucky History Hour. We are going to take just a minute to let everyone in, and then we will get started. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. All right, if you are like me and you have a device near you, you might want to take this opportunity to silence it as we're getting started here with Northern Kentucky History Hour here in just about 60 seconds or so while we let everybody in. Good crowd tonight. Also, just a reminder as you're joining us, um, your microphone will need to stay muted, but we do want you to participate. So if you have any questions or uh, any comments that you'd like to share with our group, uh, please put those in the chat box and I will be monitoring that throughout the entire evening. Hi everyone, thanks if you're just now joining us. We're uh, getting started here with Northern Kentucky History Hour. Uh, great crowd tonight, so it's taking a second to let everybody in. Um, while we get started, also just as a reminder, um, if you have your camera on, um, even if you cannot see us, we can probably still see you depending on what device we're using um, you know, we might still be able to see you on your video. So you're welcome to leave it on, but just to let you know, we are streaming live on Facebook and, um, you know, you might want to turn it off. All right, great. Well, I think we've got just about everybody. We'll keep monitoring that. I'm Tara johnson Nome, and I am the vice chair of Behringer Crawford Museum's Board of Trustees. So happy to have you with us tonight. If you're a first time participant in Northern Kentucky History Hour, um, it is great to be back after a couple week hiatus for holiday programming. Hope everybody was able to tune in to Behringer Crawford's holiday programs. If you weren't, um, really some incredible heritage programs and they're still available on the Facebook page and on YouTube. So check those out. Um, also, tomorrow is New Year's Eve. So cheers to uh, a great year so far with at least with Northern Kentucky History Hour, to uh, be able to uh, keep everybody entertained and educated with uh, some of our region's interesting history. It's been an incredible program for our family uh, to get to hear from so many incredible authors and um, historians, archeologists throughout what now have been 28 episodes. So uh, thank you so much for coming along on this fun journey with us. And uh, we certainly look forward to many more. We've got some fun things coming up scheduled for January. Um, if you don't know, this uh, program is a project of Behringer Crawford Museum. And we are so grateful to all the staff at the museum, as well as all of my fellow trustees. I see a lot of them on uh, tonight. So uh, please join me in thanking them. And thank you so much to all of our financial supporters. Um, we, Behringer Crawford Museum is supported in part by the City of Covington, Kenton County Fiscal Court, Arts Wave, the Kentucky Arts Council, the Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, um, the Carol Ann and Ralph V. Hale Jr. U.S. Bank Foundation, and our members. And if I didn't say Arts Wave, Arts Wave. Um, if you're not a member yet of the museum, we would love for you to consider, consider joining. And you can find out more at bcmuseum.org. And it also has the website, all the upcoming programming uh, that's available. Okay, just a few reminders. Um, I said earlier, as we were, everybody was getting in, um, everybody will stay muted, but please, please, please put your questions and comments in the chat so we can find out what you're thinking during the, con uh, the conversation. And if, um, let's see here. If you want to find out more, you got to stay till the end because we do have some great programming coming up in January. Let's get to tonight's speaker. Mr. Paul A. Tincotti, actually Dr. Paul Tincotti, has authored or edited 14 books, contributed chapters to eight additional books, and written hundreds of articles for a wide range of publications. They include Cincinnati, the Queen City, which was the uh, anniversary edition uh, with Dan Hurley, the Encyclopedia of Northern Kentucky with James Claypool, Gateway City, Covington, Kentucky, 1815 to 2015, and a textbook, the United States since 1865. 
information literacy, and critical thinking. Tinkati has been a contributor to 16 television documentaries, including PBS's 10 That Changed America, Engineering Marvels, award-winning productions, including Sacred Spaces of Greater Cincinnati, and Where the River Bends, A History of Northern Kentucky. He serves as professor of history at Northern Kentucky University and also edits the weekly Our Rich History column for the Northern Kentucky Tribune. Um, and I hope you have been uh, reading those because they're really fascinating. So uh, without further uh, ado for me, I welcome uh, Dr. Tinkati. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Okay, glad to be here. Very glad to be here. And uh, can you see the whole screen, Tara? Yes, Everything sir, it looks good? great. All right. So organizing for action, women's suffrage in Northern Kentucky. And this is a photo in 1920 of the governor signing the 19th Amendment. And we wish we knew who all of these women were, but we know that- Dr. Tinkati, all sorry. of a sudden, I can't see your um, presentation anymore. You can't see my presentation I anymore. saw it and now I can't see it. Huh, let's try that again. So how's this? Okay, good. Nope. No, not good. Okay, let's do. We can oh. see it. Oh, you everybody can else can see it. Oh my, 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 my. Great, my. everybody else but me can see oh, it, so wow. that's fine. Now I need to come back. Go to the right. As long as they can see it, that's just fine. Okay, good. Okay, that may be because we're we're co whatever. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Some of the ladies that we're going to talk about this evening are actually in this photograph, but. They did not identify, you know, each and every person here, unfortunately. All right. The great sort of labor leader, Dolores Huerta, once said, every moment is an organizing opportunity. Every person, a potential activist. Every minute, a chance to change the world. And that's really where the idea for the title is tonight, organizing for action. Women have been involved in organizing for important reforms since the very early years of our nation. And one of the most important reforms that women were involved in was the anti-slavery movement or the abolitionist movement. And uh, let me give you an instance of that. This is something that many people know about. In January of 1856, an enslaved person by the name of Margaret Garner and 16 other enslaved people left during a very cold winter day, the Gaines Farm in Boone County, Kentucky. They were captured in Cincinnati and there in a house in the West End, Margaret Garner, and her family where the slave catchers uh, had, caught, had caught them and they were ready to drag them off. And just at that point in time, Margaret Garner uh, got a hold of a butcher knife and went to kill her two two and a half year old daughter, Mary, rather than to see her daughter return to slavery. This is, um, Oh. which was the inspiration for Toni Morrison's Beloved, which of course has become uh, a, uh, an opera and everything else. But it shows you that women of all backgrounds, of all uh, different ethnicities, were involved particularly in the reform movement for, uh, against slavery. Now, there are, were other women that were involved in that effort as well. And this is not, of course, uh, a lecture about the Underground Railroad in Northern Kentucky or in the area. But there is one woman that I wanna mention because she is really never mentioned whatsoever. Her husband is always mentioned. His name was William S. Bailey. And he was the editor of an abolitionist new, uh, newspaper in Newport, Kentucky called the Free South. It was also the only Republican newspaper in the state of Kentucky 
during uh, the Civil War era. Well, his wife, Carolyn Ann Withnell Berry, was born in Wheeling, Virginia. We now know it as West Virginia, in that sort of northern panhandle of uh, Virginia, which became West Virginia, which had a lot of abolitionist activities. And she, alongside with her husband and their more than a dozen children, all helped in operating this press called the Free South. It was not well received at all in this area. In fact, in 1851, a mob torched the Bailey home in Newport. And that was during the evening, by the way. So, you know, they were clearly out to literally kill the entire family. Later on in 1859, a mob destroyed the presses always standing alongside her husband as an abolitionist was Carolyn Ann Withnell Berry. The sad thing is she died in Covington in March, 1867. He would live for a number of years thereafter and eventually moved to Tennessee, but we have no known photographs of her, no known illustrations. There is one here, however, of her husband. So that brings us to this thing. Generally speaking, why have the stories of so many regional women's leaders been lost and are just now being rediscovered? There are, there are a number of reasons for this. Much of American history was written by men. The primary sources of the time, newspapers, magazines, contained fewer stories about women. And later on, when they finally did contain stories about women, they often focused on kind of society news. Now that many of those resources are being digitized, we are for the first time really enabled to discover what was really the hidden history of women and other overlooked groups. And in this way, we're beginning to balance the scale and recover some of the stories of women from the past. And so tonight you're going to hear a story which in all modesty, we have never really uncovered before now in time for the 100th anniversary or the centennial of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. And that is women's suffrage. Why did it take so long and what do we know and how can we bring back and resurrect the, the courageous women who helped to enable that amendment to be passed? Well, first we go back to the end of the Civil War and the passage of three amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, uh, freeing the slaves, making them citizens, and giving the former male slaves, right, the men, the right to vote. Now, women, many reformist women, many abolitionist women were very disappointed by the 15th Amendment because they were fighting for and crusading for and appearing before the US Congress and gave logical and rational arguments as to why the 15th Amendment should include women and the, their right to vote. However, that was not to be. The 15th Amendment was passed, it excluded women, it was adopted in 1870 and there it is being celebrated in that lithograph to the left. And that lithograph to the left, for those of you who are out there, and I recognize some of you artists out there, will know this lithograph was um, executed by James Beard, who lived on Third Street in Covington. He was an artist, a fairly well-known artist. Um, he was a friend of the Grant family because Ulysses S. Grant's father, Jesse Grant, lived just you know around the block from him. So there we have it, a Covingtonian 
celebrating in a noted lithograph, the 15th Amendment to the Constitution. Well, before we can discuss what women were crusading for, we have to tell you the boundaries that they experienced in their lives. Because women today and men today, really we have no idea of how circumscribed the social, economic, and legal boundaries were for women. So let's give you some examples. Women historians, feminist historians, have for a number of years described what they refer to in the late 19th and early 20th century is the cult of domesticity. And the cult of domesticity is just a fancy title no. for, for what we um, now call, I'm sorry, was there a problem? Oh, okay. Uh, for what we now call the idea that women's place generally, socially, economically, politically, and legally was regarded as being in the home, in the domestic circle. That their purpose in life was seen as being good mothers, good wives, right? Good daughters, that they would raise their children, they would provide more, a moral upbringing for those children, and in fact, they would not solely or kind of soil themselves with all of the corruption and the graft and the horrible things that happened in the political and economic world. So their husbands would go out and face every day like, quote unquote, knights in armor, all of the ugly things of the world. But when the husband came home, the domestic, the home was someplace, right, that was considered almost sacred. And the obligation of a patriotic American woman was to help and be family oriented. There were, however, few employment opportunities outside the house for many women. And you might say, well, they didn't need to work. Actually, nothing could be further from the truth a vast number of poor women and women in the lower middle class had to work outside the home in order to support their families. So where did they work? They worked in a number of places. If, um, if they were fortunate enough, their husband perhaps had a small shop and they would, that's usually middle class women or upper middle class women, and they would assist uh, say, in the shop of their husband. If they were poorer women, they could be working in all kinds of uh, scenarios. Many times uh, women were working as um, maids in, in the homes of upper middle class women or upper class women. But a lot of women in the 19th century, the late 19th century and the early 20th century, were working in factories. And that includes the factories of Cincinnati, Covington, Newport, and this daily, uh, and, and this area, direct area. There was actually a report in 1911, which came out right about the time of, but does not seem to have been actually related to, it just seemed to have been coincidental. Um, at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire in New York City, which killed hundreds of women in a factory that was a multi-level factory. And by the way, Cincinnati was filled with multi-level, multi-story factories. We're talking factories that were eight, nine, ten stories tall, in which women were engaged a lot in making things like shoes and clothing, etc. Well, this is what the 1911 report of the commission to investigate the conditions of working women in Kentucky said, quote, the lives of working women in Kentucky are daily threatened by the total absence of fire escapes or by structures that are themselves death traps. Their health is menaced by insufficient light and ventilation, by the failure to provide seats and by long hours of work. 
To make matters worse, the wages of women were lower than those for men, and those for black women were typically lower still than those for white women in comparable jobs. In its 1911 report, the Kentucky Commission investigated 186 factories employing over 11,000 women. And that was only about less than one fourth of the women who were employed in factories in the state. So at that time already there were, you know, times it by four, over 44,000 women working in factories in the state. And the study revealed that while a basic survival wage in the city of Louisville would require $6.50 a week, two thirds of the working women in Kentucky earned less than that. And one fourth of them earned $4 or less per week. Now those were social and economic boundaries. What about legal boundaries? For years, and I know a number of lawyers are out there, um, there was the common law, which went all the way back to England, which talked really about, and, and we're separating this into coverture and femme sole. Coverture essentially meant the following, that once a woman got married, her property became the property of her husband, okay? She had no right to that property. Pop property. Now, if she were wealthy enough, she could possibly have a male friend who somehow held some of that property on her behalf. But again, that was wealthy women who had the contacts, the connections, and the lawyers to do that work. For the common everyday woman and for the middle class woman, their property became the property of their husbands. Now, what about people that were single? single unmarried women or widows, they could own property and you're gonna see they had a few more rights than married women did. One of the things that Kentucky is known for is one of the first laws in the United States giving women a partial suffrage. And by suffrage, we mean right to vote or what we sometimes call the franchise. In 1838, the General Assembly passed a law that said any widow or femme sole, and they, they couldn't spell very well back in those days, so they misspelled it, over 21 years of age, residing and owning property subject to taxation for school purposes, could vote in a school district election. Okay, so only school districts. That was one thing that they could do, but not any married women, because married women were regarded, they were thought that it, it wasn't necessary that they have the right to vote because the male in their life, the man in their life, rather that be their husband, their father, their son, would on behalf of them, you know, represent them in a democratic republic like the United States. In 1872, Kentucky began to do what a number of other states were doing, and that is allowing married women to retain wages from jobs that they performed outside of the home. And that was considered a fairly big deal back then, you know, that a woman could go outside the home, earn her own wages, and keep those wages. What you also have to remember in all of this is that um, if a woman divorced or a husband divorced his wife, it really didn't matter. In the vast majority of cases, the woman was left with the clothes on her back and maybe some of her jewelry. Anything she had brought into the marriage did not automatically return with her with a divorce. And furthermore, more than likely in the majority of cases, the court would assign children and the custody of children to men, not to women. Now, in 1893, uh, the Kentucky General Assembly finally extended property rights 
to married women. So you can see that this is a long, long struggle, but there are still many, many boundaries. So now that you know what it was like somewhat, you have somewhat of an idea of what it was like to be a woman in that time period, then it helps to know what women were fighting for. So they came out of the Civil War era. They're approaching, you know, the, the, the 1870 date when finally, you know, enough um, states ratify the amendment, right? The, uh, the 15th Amendment, excuse me, the 15th Amendment. They're going to be disappointed by that because it doesn't include the right for women to vote. And in 1869, really four big things happened. Three of them are national and one is local. So let's go to the national one first. In 1869, the Wyoming territory became the first place in the US to grant women unconditionally the right to vote and to hold political office, okay? And um, that was of course a big deal. In May of 1869, as you can see here from the photo from the Library of Congress, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, two of the well-known women's rights leaders at the national level, established the National Woman Suffrage Association, the NWSA. And by the way, you're gonna see them call this different thing. Woman suffrage, woman's with a, you know, an apostrophe S and then women, women's suffrage, three or four things, it's all right, okay? Every, every one of the ways is right. They would, the, NW, the NWSA would pursue at first a constitutional amendment, a US constitutional amendment. Now that's important because another group would form in November of, of 18, in 1869, a little later, and it would be established by a well-known woman a suffrage leader and women's rights leader called Lucy Stone. And she established the American Woman Suffrage Association, a WSA, which initially focused on attaining women's suffrage state by state. So, there's, there's the, they're both wanting women's suffrage. That is the mission, right? But the goals to obtain it were a little different. The NWSA said, we're gonna go for a, uh, an amendment, a national right amendment to the constitution. Uh, the AWSA said, we're, we're gonna concentrate on getting it state by state. Now, having said that, I'll say this. Later on, they both kind of started to do both things and a variety of other things as well. And eventually they would even uh, combine into one organization. Now, the interesting thing about this is Lucy Stone was no stranger to Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky. In fact, back in 1869, she delivered a lecture entitled Women's Rights at Pike's Music Hall on 4th Street. It was brand new. The new music hall replaced an earlier one that had been completely destroyed by fire two years earlier. And it's shown here, Pike's Opera House on 4th Street. You know, this was a big deal. If you are lecturing in the newest, largest, best opera house in the city, this is a big deal. And the papers reported what she had to say. And guess what she had to say? She said, you know, this is nonsense. Women are represented by their husbands and by their fathers and sons. Why, nobody represents anybody else in a democracy. And then she talked about the Declaration of Independence and she talked about the Constitution. And she talked about why it would be the right thing to have women's suffrage but she didn't stop there. She spoke about the inequalities, how women were working for lower wages and how if women were never recognized as truly equals and had equal rights, that that would never constitute a real democratic republic. And it caused quite a stir, but she had a big audience and that audience was largely in support of her. 
Well, what else happened in 1869? And this is one of the most interesting stories that we've uncovered. There was a man by the name of Joseph Bailey Quinby and his wife, Anna, Annie Quinby. And they attended the National Organizational Meeting in New York in May 1869 of the NWSA. They knew Anthony and Stanton. And by the way, they had a history. The Quinbys were abolitionists and they ran a press in New Orleans until basically the Civil War occurred and it wasn't safe for them to be operating an abolitionist press in New Orleans, Louisiana. So they moved to Cincinnati. And by 1872 or so, they had moved across the river to Dayton, Kentucky. And they were involved in women's suffrage on both sides of the river. And they pushed for the city council of Dayton, Kentucky in 1872. And the city council wanted to uh, raise more funds. So they wanted to go into more, you know, uh, bonded indebtedness as a city. And they were having a referendum on this. And the city council said, yeah, yeah, go ahead. We'll allow women to vote. It was un unheard of. This wasn't any kind of, uh, uh, of an election for a school board. This was, you know, it's a referendum for the city. Can we, get, can we engage with more debt? And women voted and boy, people were not happy. Read this in the newspapers. We cannot but regret that anything of the kind should have happened in Kentucky. For it should be, we think, the desire of every true man, every true friend of women's elevation to see her remain in the sacred, hallowed sphere of home and the social circle to which the wisdom of the highest civilization and her own unerring instinctive taste have assigned her, and to keep her as far away as possible from the infectious pollutions, the horrid contaminations that surround the hustlings and envelop the ballot box, carry out the views of the women's rights agitators of this country, and then we may say farewell, a long farewell to the poetry of creation. After that, no more women in this country, nothing but a nation of big bearded men and vaunting Amazons. <laughs> that says everything that I've told you so far. Why, gosh, it's in there in print, and it's not the only place we see that. So one of the ways that the press reacts to these women's rights advocates is they get a little personal. Imagine that, a little personal. And, and they, they refer to them in print as, as very usually manly and masculine, and then they make um, aspersions as to maybe she's kind of uh, this one or that one is kind of homely, unfeminine, wears, wears things like men, and probably never could have founded herself a husband, right? This is really personal stuff. This isn't logical stuff. This isn't rational stuff. So listen, it's been going on for a long time. Well, we come to two of the most important women in Kentucky, and it's the Clay Sisters, uh, and it especially, you know, not only Mary Barclay, but Lucy, uh, Laura Clay, excuse me. Well, speaking of abolitionism, Cassius Marcellus Clay was an abolitionist down there in the area of Richmond, Kentucky. And his wife was Mary Jane Warfield Clay, a suffragist. Um, the Clay sisters, so their, their daughters, were, uh, they had a number of daughters. One was um, Laura Clay, another one was Mary Barr. And they attended the AWSA National Convention, which was in Louisville in October, 1881. And in fact, Mary Barr became president of the AWSA in 1883. So Kentuckian became president. Uh, Laura Clay uh, was doing some other things, raising her family, but in 1888, she decided to become an activist 
and she co-founded the Fayette Equal Rights Association. That's Fayette County as in Lexington. And the cool thing in here is you thought Kira was a new thing, right? The Kentucky Education Reform Act. The Kira we're going to talk about tonight has, is the Kentucky Equal Rights Association. It's what the women founded, as we're going to see. And almost all of these are called Equal Rights Association. Now, notice in their mission statement, they said to advance the industrial, educational, and legal rights of women and to secure suffrage to them by appropriate state and national legislation. So already by the 1880s, they're doing everything. Suffrage is one of the things, but they want women to have the same legal rights and the same um, you know, access to industrial and educational opportunities. And then we come to a marvelous lady who we just uncovered in the past couple of years, her life story was lost to history. And her name is Eugenia Farmer. And this is the only illustration that we know of her. Eugenia Farmer was born in New York City, but she grew up in Cincinnati and she even attended for a couple years Oberlin College. Imagine that, a woman in the 1800s uh, attending a college, which by the way, was co-educational. She married Henry Farmer in 1858. And during the Civil War, they lived in St. Louis. His job had him moving around quite a lot. And there they, they lost their infant son, which was you know, a fairly common occurrence back in the 19th century. Infants would fall prey to all kinds of diseases and things. But she was so heartbroken and she went to her doctor and her doctor said, you know, you need to do something to get your mind off of this. I think you should um, do some volunteer work. So she began volunteering in a Civil War hospital in St. Louis. And there she met a man who had three sons. The man and his three sons had all joined the Union Army and all four of them had lost a leg in the Civil War. Imagine that, lost the, a leg, father and his three sons. And so she helped them and helped so many others and her sense of the need to reform and to make the world a better place really began there. And for a while, she moved to Washington DC with her husband and she met and became friends with none other than Susan B. Anthony. Eventually his job brought them to Covington. And in October of 1888, she and another lady by the name of Isabella Shepherd established the Kenton County Equal Rights Association. This is right on the heels of the Fayette County Equal Rights Association. This is one of the first Equal Rights Association, one of the first women's suffrage organizations in the state of Kentucky. And the following month, the AWSA held its national convention in Cincinnati. And there, Laura Clay, Eugenia Farmer, Isabella Shepard, and other ERA candidates from Kenton and Fayette counties established the Kentucky Equal Rights Association. Some people say they crossed the river over to Covington and established the Kentucky Equal Rights Association. So if anyone wants to beam with pride over Northern Kentucky and Covington and Newport, you're gonna beam with pride at the absolute influence that women from this area in Northern Kentucky had in the Kentucky women's suffrage movement. Now, that other person that helped her create this was born in Kentucky and her father was a well-known steamboat captain. Her name was Isabella Shepard. I've never been able to find a photo or an illustration of her, but I found in 1929, she lived a nice long life, her obituary. 
She married John C. Shepard in December 1872, and it was not a happy marriage. They divorced. On behalf of Kira, the Kentucky Equal Rights Association, she gave many lectures statewide, you know, trying to get other women across the state in, uh, enthusiastic about the movement, et cetera. And she served as treasurer of Kira as well, died in Louisiana in 1929. And then there was another wonderful lady, Dr. Sarah Sewers. And we were fortunate to find a real photograph of her in Cincinnati, the Queen City, uh, volume three, published in 1912. She was born in Cincinnati, but raised on a farm in Campbell County, and she attended Newport High School. She then did what very few women accomplished in the 19th century. And that is she graduated from a medical college. It was called the Eclectic Medical College. And in 1890, she founded the Campbell County Equal Rights Association. Now she actually had her medical office in Cincinnati and she lived in Cincinnati. So she, was more, she became more active in their women's suffrage movement, but she remained active in Kentucky. She was longtime president of the Susan B. Anthony Club in Cincinnati, and she also served as president of the Walnut Hills WCTU. And if any of you want to know what WCTU is, we're going to get to it. It's the Women Christian Temperance Union. In 1894, Laura Clay, Eugenia Farmer, and Josephine Henry lobbied the Kentucky General Assembly for a bill to allow women in second-class cities Second class cities by population were Covington, Lexington, and Newport to vote in municipal school board elections. With the help of Senator Goebel, later on assassinated as governor, the bill passed the assembly. And Covington, Lexington, and Newport made history in fall 1895, becoming the first large cities in the Commonwealth to permit partial women's suffrage. They even ran candidates for the Covington School Board and guess what? Both white women and black women in Covington and Lexington voted in the elections. These courageous women made the decision to enroll and register black women at a time period when they had everything to lose by doing that. We actually see an editorial comic of the time period which was discounting women's suffrage, implying that they might, they might vote for the more handsome Schwelt candidate over here. And then this one that I guess would be considered, you know, you know, the nose and all a little bit less, more homely. He wouldn't get a single vote. And then over there, look at they've they've put bows on the ballot box and everything else and ribbons. So again, you see what people thought of that. They did this also in Newport in 1895 and again in 1896. And these were three women, Virginia Bowers, Hannah Spring and Sarah Charles who ran for the school board. They lost, but they ran. Covington and Newport held many annual conventions for Kira. And most of those occurred at Trinity Episcopal Church, three of them, three of the six, in Covington. And so they were simply, Newport and Covington were very important to the Kentucky efforts. Well, what do we know about Eugenia Farmer? Her husband and her joined the Shakers in New Lebanon, New York by 1900. They didn't stay there very long. They mustn't have been to their liking and they actually moved again but by about 1899, 1900, they were out of the picture. And she was such a great leader that without her, the movement began to splinter in Covington. And uh, Mrs. Mary Giltner became one of five charter members of the 20th Century Club, later renamed the Covington Equal Rights Movement. So this is when you start to notice a splintering in the movement. Now, Women were voting in Covington, Lexington, and Newport for school board candidates. And then in 1902, the Kentucky General Assembly revoked that law. 
And basically they did it because of two things. One was the controversial inclusion of black women in voting, which the General Assembly did not like, as well as the women's leaders support of temperance. And that was temperance against alcohol abuse. We'll talk about that in a minute. But just to show you that the women's rights movement was not a monolith and had many opinions occurring, we're gonna look at a couple less controversial um, women, uh, less con more controversial, excuse me, um, uh, viewpoints. One was from Kate Trimble Woolsey, who was born in Cynthiana, but grew up right in Covington. And she was from a wealthy family and she married wealthy. Both of her husbands died. She wrote a very controversial book in 1903 called Republics Versus Women. She said that some of, and she traveled widely to Europe, that some of the monarchies and the nations of Europe were more forward-looking in terms of women's rights than the United States was. Uh, she also believed in eugenics and engineering better babies. So she was, she was really involved in many kinds of different activities uh, of the time period. She attended many women's conventions throughout Europe and the United States. There was also another controversial figure who was born in Newport, Kentucky to the wealthy Williamson family. And she was a free thinker and we could talk about that for days, but we're not going to. But she served on the revising committee of Elizabeth Cady Stanton's The Women's Bible, a highly controversial work for its day and her radical stances eventually dulled her friendship with Laura Clay, even though Eugenia Farmer tried to act as a go-between. So the General Assembly says in 1902, no more women's suffrage for, right? For you guys in second-class cities because we don't like the fact you've got women, black women voting, and we don't like the fact that many of you are for temperance. And you think about that and you say, they were for temperance, why? Well, husbands sometimes got their paychecks and spent a lot of their paychecks. Imagine what that did to women and families. Imagine what it caused in terms of alcohol abuse. And some of that included spouse abuse or child abuse. So it's really, no wonder that a lot of these movements were intersecting with the same kind of women. So what happens? How does it turn around? Now that the General Assembly, it turns around with a lady from Covington called Jessica Firth. And by the way, she was not only president of the Covington Equal Rights Association, but also the Women's Temperance Union. And she and others were instrumental and in March of 1912, the Kentucky General Assembly restored the right of women to vote in school elections. And the following year, she attended this major rally, March in Washington, DC, the first of its kind really, where thousands of women from all over the country came. She organized on behalf of, of Kira, she traveled over 4,500 miles by rail to and spoke to 839 new members all over Kentucky. And eventually what the Kentuckians like Jessica Firth, who was in that photo that we showed you in the signing in 1920 by the, uh, by the uh, governor, but we don't know where she was. We just know she was there. Um, she would become in 1923, the first woman in Kenton County to, rate, to run for state public office. She ran on the Republican ticket for the state house of representatives for the 64th district. And although she lost the election, she made history. And as um, my good friend, Will Terwart reminds us, the, the Republican party was the party that supported at that time 
uh, what had just kind of gone on and benefited also. There was one other person that we don't, we know a lot about, and her name was Dr. Louise Southgate. Um, she lived in Covington in this house that still exists on Garrett Street. And she also was in a women's suffrage and yet another women's suffrage or organization and involved in reform efforts. So Kentucky governor, Edwin Morrow, and here's that picture and somewhere here, you know, Elizabeth is there, we don't know where, signed the 19th amendment on January 6 of 1920. Kentucky was the 24th state to ratify the amendment in August 1920, um, Tennessee became the 36th state. There were 48 states at the time, so that meant that then the 19th Amendment was in fact ratified. And for it all, Northern Kentucky women stood strong. Jessica Firth, Eugenia Farmer, and so many others. For some more information, uh, you can see any of these sources, a number of them are our rich history and an upcoming all article and the spring Northern Kentucky heritage by yours truly on all of the above with even more photographs to whet your appetite. And now we come to the point where we accept questions. And by the way, thank you for your rapt attention. Definitely had everybody's attention, including mine. I was trying to furiously take pictures and screenshots. So um, can you hear me okay, Dr. Tincotti? I certainly can. Wonderful. Okay, my computer acting up a bit. So I'm glad everything is good. We have a few minutes for questions. Um, if anybody wants to add any more, but we do have some to start off. Um, oh. I just put, oh, is that there what you, you want it? Yeah, um, hold can on see me? one second. I'm having a little trouble, but as long as you can, let's see. Okay, there we are. All yeah, is we're well. Put, we're putting up all our- All our, is well. Yes. All, our, all these wonderful- <laughs> Yeah, now we can see everybody. Um, so let's see here. The first question, and I, I would, this is a clarifying question for me um, about one of the questions we got in the chat. So can you remind me, what was the name of the Quinby's newspaper? Um, the Quinby's newspaper, they had a number of newspapers okay. across the, the years. Um, they, I don't, I don't know, he kept changing. He kept changing. But if you email me, I can get that information out to no, you. That's, that's fine. And the reason I asked was, one of the questions was, and I guess this was somebody else's, wasn't C.M. Clay's anti-slavery newspaper, The True American, originally in Lexington and then moved to Cincinnati. And it sounds like that was a similar story to what was going on with the Quimby's is that they, that they moved. Can yeah, you talk a little bit about that? Um, Cassius Marcellus Clay, mm -hmm. um, of course, was the father of Mary Barr Clay and Laura Clay. And he was a very well-known uh, abolitionists of Whitehall and also um, was involved in, in this whole effort. Um, he was from the area of Richmond and at one point in time um, he pretty well um, moved operations as did um, uh, Reverend Fee um, who, who uh, formed later on a, um, a community of people at Berea. Um, if, if things got hot in one place, they, they would move off to another place. The only person that refused that I know to, to move was um, Bailey. Um, and mm. you know, he was, William Shreve Bailey was absolutely and completely like, I don't care if you try to burn me out, if you want to destroy my press, I am not moving to Cincinnati. I am wow. remaining in Kentucky and I am publishing this newspaper. And in fact, a bunch of people, some of whom were slave owners, uh, got together the 19th century equivalent of a GoFundMe page. And that obviously, they got together and they raised money to help Bailey rebuild his press. Wow. And, you know, that, that, that's, I think, an amazing thing that, you know, you, you have this, this horrible violence that takes place 
And yet at the same time, you have people who utterly disagreed with the man. And by the way, Reverend Fee was not a, um, was not at all a fan of William Shreve Barry. And I'm not so certain Cassius Clay was very much a fan mm. of Bailey either. They, they thought he was too much of a free thinker. He was not a godly enough person. Mm. Uh, basically, he, he didn't know really whether he believed in religion and all that. And, and so he in, himself is, a, is, a, is an interesting character. Whereas Cassius Clay, you know, later on becomes a diplomat. He's the gentleman of Whitehall, et cetera. He's this voice uh, and his wife is a voice for suffrage. Interesting, that's fascinating. So what another question that I had, and, and I, mean, I think I know the answer, but you know, when Kentucky gave single women or widowed women the right to vote in school elections in 1838, was that just the thinking that school and education was more of like a women's world than say municipal elections? Was that, was that the rationale behind the tie to schools? That is a really good question. And I wish I knew the answer to that. I mean, when we start going back into the 1830s in terms of legislation and in terms of newspapers, things get very sparse. But sure. I'm thinking that yes, the answer to that and the answer to why even later on in the 1890s, William Goebel would fight for this and women would want this is because many times women were the educators. They were not only the educators in terms of being the teachers. And by the way, when women taught in places like public schools, um, if they were single, that was kind of fine. But if they got married, they were expected to just resign and take mm. care of their husband and their families. Um, so that was one of the few um, professional opportunities for women that was available. And if you think of, say, private schools and, say, Catholic schools, um, Catholic women, particularly Catholic nuns, were also professional women of their day. I mean, they were, they were not only building hospitals and orphanages and schools and funding them that they were directing they were like presidents and principals and 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 all of that so outside of the home women in with protestant churches and running sunday schools and being teachers had always gravitated to that because the education of children was considered part of the women's sphere of influence mm. That's so fascinating. I have loved every every bit of this presentation and really appreciate you. you joining us. I hope you'll come back sometime. I will definitely um, come back. One question that I have to ask before we say goodbye is you've done so many projects. What's next for you? What's next? Well, we're finishing up a, um, I think we're up to part 57 this coming week of Newport. Newport is 225 ah. years old. And we are going to be publishing the best of those essays in a Newport book. And cool. then I'm also working on another project with um, Dave Schroeder. And it will be on Catholicism in Kentucky and especially uh, immigrants. So um, I've got a couple things out there. And so um, we're hoping to some of this. In, and by the way, too, with kind of um, Pam Spore and others. The next project we want for our rich history is to kind of look in a series of articles at the city of Park Hills to get ready for its centennial. So um, I really encourage people to look at our rich history. And if you have a topic and if you want to write a guest column to get a hold of me and I, you know, we and we really invite people. Our rich history in the Northern Kentucky Tribune, I don't get paid for it. I'm a volunteer. All of us are volunteers. And it's certainly an opportunity to share with the community the richness of our history. 52 columns is a lot of columns per year. And we're, we're approaching very soon here in a few weeks, our 300th column. So we've been at it for like six years. 
So uh, this belongs to everyone and it's an opportunity to get your story, the story of your church, your business, your family out there in the public and to get lots of photographs. Our readers like photographs and illustrations. It's not a scholarly thing. We don't do footnotes and stuff unless you have something really good that you wanna say it's from the you know, Kentucky Post in 1912 or something, we do that. But it's more public history, more interest, and we encourage that. Very cool. That is so exciting. And congratulations on nearing Thank 300. You. That's that's amazing. Well, we would love to have you back to talk about Newport. Um, not sure we can do a uh, 52 part series, but maybe we can get some of those highlights in. Um, and, and right by the way, we're kind of standing on the the shoulders of people like Jim Reese, who for years did a series that I would read every single one every week in the Kentucky Post. And I okay. think that really energized people. Wonderful. I, I think it's awesome. And I think we have quite a community here um, that's really, really does appreciate that work. So thank you so much. Um, before we go, thanks to all of you who have stuck with us. We do want to let everybody know, we've mentioned Dave Schroeder's name a couple times. He will be joining us next week to talk about the 100th anniversary of Thomas More University. On January 13th, we will have Peter Bronson to talk about his new book on the Beverly Hills Supper Club fire. Uh, he's been making the rounds quite a bit lately, but we're excited to have him. And on January 20th, we'll have Paul Whalen join us to talk about his new book, um, I think it might not even be uh, ready for purchase yet. It's very new on the profiles of Kentucky's United States senators from 1792 to present. So very excited about um, a very uh, rich conversation throughout the month of January when it's too cold and wet to do anything else. So it's a perfect time. Um, and then let's see. Oh, we have uh, a note from John Tree to uh, make sure everybody visits the... Um, let's see, visit the enormous contribution of Cincinnati and the world by Harriet Beecher Stowe. And I'm assuming that the Stowe house might be open right now. So uh, yes, please make sure to, um, you know, frequent our local uh, heritage and cultural institutions. Uh, you can do that both online and, uh, you know, in person at BCM, or I'm sorry, bcmuseum.org for Bayer Crawford Museum. I do want to take um, a host uh, moment to say that before we go, I'd like to recognize one of our most loyal attendees, Jim and Martha Johnson, as far as I know, have attended every one of our episodes. They also happen to be my parents and they now reside out of state. And since we cannot be together today, I would like to say happy birthday, mom. So everyone else, I hope you have a great night and we will see you next week. Take care. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye-bye.